So we are nearing the end of the book. We're on chapter 50. Yesterday, when we left off, who did Moon meet for the first time? His Meets his uncle. Uh, and Moon, one of the first things Moon asks him, he's like, are you mad at me? And his uncle's like, shoot, no, I'm not mad at you, Moon. I didn't know you even were around. And so he's got a bunch of family. Do you guys remember how much family he has back in Mobile? <laughs> Yeah. His uncle's family. I, I think they also mentioned grandma and grandpa, maybe. And grandma and grandpa. Yeah. So he's got some family. He's got some kin down there in, in Mobile. And his uncle came to get him, which is kind of, it's probably a sad goodbye for Mr. Wellington because it seems like Mr. Wellington took a liking to Moon and was willing to help him out. Chapter 50. After loading my things and saying goodbye to Mr. Wellington, we followed the river south on a two-lane highway, leaving behind the limestone hills and cedar groves of Sumter County. We moved through a land of hard, dusty clay and broom sledge and pines that I'd never seen. Uncle Mike's truck was worn and comfortable. He sat back and drove with his wrist flopped over the top of the steering wheel like nothing worried him. The cool spring air swept across our faces and I sensed I was being drawn to a place I had been stolen from long ago. So I guess you're my pap now. He smiled. Well, I'd like of you to think of me that way. Then I'd like to ask you some things. Okay, go ahead. What about Mr. Wellington and Hal? Will I get to see them again? Sure. I'll drive you up sometime if you want. It only takes about four hours, and you can even write letters. I'm good at writing letters. Mr. Wellington said he was going to come check on you in a couple of weeks, but he said he'd try to bring you your rifle when he came down. It made me feel better to think that I'd see Mr. Wellington again in so short a time. I watched out the window and saw a school and students standing out front waiting to be picked up. Station wagons and parents and buses clustered and moved about. A boy wake, taking down a flag from a flagpole. I turned to Uncle Mike. Do you remember me? We all remember you when you were little. Your daddy and mama didn't disappear until about a year after you were born. Well, why didn't you come looking for us? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. At first, we were worried that something happened to y'all. It didn't take long to find out that Oliver had to shut down his had shut down his bank accounts in Birmingham and sold his house and car. He didn't leave a note or anything. I drove up several times after that and asked around about you. You never had grandparents on your mother's side, so there wasn't anyone to talk to there. Well, why didn't he want you all to find us? Uncle Mike was quiet for a few seconds. Finally, he looked over at me. No one knows why he did what he did. I can tell you that I remember him as a boy, no different from any other boy. He was my best friend growing up. Some people change when they get older. Sometimes things happen that make them change a lot. In your father's case, he saw something in Vietnam that caused him to lose trust in everybody around him. But you were his best friend. He saw a lot of friends die over there. Maybe he didn't want any more friends. My friend died too. I said, yeah, Mr. Wellington told me about Kit. Sorry that happened. I looked out the window again. Moon? Yes, sir? The important thing is that you don't have to feel the way your father did. Most people don't. I leaned my head against the door and slept with the wind licking through my bangs. I woke up when Uncle Mike pulled the truck over at a spur station for gas. He smiled at me in the rearview mirror and pumped as the pump numbers clicked over. Afterwards, he strolled inside and I watched him pay through the store glass. He came out with Two bags of potato chips and threw one into my window as he passed. Back on the road, Uncle Mike dialed the radio to a country station and played it low. I sat with my back against the door frame and ate my potato chips and watched his face while he chewed. He looked up at me once and smiled and then stared ahead at the blacktop. You like him? Yes, sir. After a second, I turned and sang in the seat and I watched the countryside. We were passing fields of rich black dirt plowed up nearly to the road. The pine trees were taller and greener and stood in the yards of white farmhouses. The land was mostly flat and the air was thick and humid like nothing I ever felt. Uncle Mike? Yeah? Thanks again for coming to get me. I'm glad I got a place to go. I don't want to be locked up anymore. I'm, I'm done being alone. He put his hand on my head and brushed my hair back and a warm feeling passed through me. Chapter 51. How much farther? I asked. About a mile. I sat up in my chair and I stared ahead. The sun was setting outside my window. The smell of soybeans and corn was strong in the cool dust. We had skirted the outside of the city and we were moving into the countryside again. To the east, I could see tall buildings of downtown, downtown Mobile standing against the horizon. How much farther now? 
Uncle Mike pointed us pointed ahead of us. That's the house right up there. First thing I noticed about Uncle Mike's house was that it was a one-story brick home backed up to a pecan orchard. I like pecan trees. Or pecan trees, depending where you're from. I like pecan trees. Well, we got a bunch. They had put up a small banner on the fence that read, Welcome home, moon. And my new family came out of the house and stood on the yard as we drove up. My, I felt my hands growing fidgety, and I looked at Uncle Mike. What do I do? He laughed. He'll be okay. Just get out of the truck and go meet everybody. I felt my face burning red as Aunt Sarah knelt down and hugged me. My new brother, David, was only a year older than me, and my new sister, Alice, a year younger. They said hello, and I nodded at them while my face was pressed into Aunt Sarah's bosom. She finally pushed me back in by the shoulders and she stared at me. He looks just like his mother. Well, they say he doesn't eat like her, Uncle Mike said. Aunt Sarah stood and sniffed and wiped her tears. Well, we'll just have to see about that, she said. Are you hungry, Moon? Yes, ma'am. I can't imagine all you've been through. I'm going to feed you four times a day to get some meat on your bones. Well, I feel pretty good now, but I like four times a day. She laughed and turned around. My Lord, she said, let's all go inside. David and Alice crowded behind me while we walked. David kept glancing over at me. I heard you beat up grown men, he finally said. Yeah, I had to whip up on a couple. People were chasing me all over. They said you had your own rifle. I nodded, me and Pat both. I got some climbing spikes daddy gave me. Climbing spikes? Yeah, you strap them onto your legs and climb up a tree straight as a pole. Man, I want to see those. What else you got? Uncle Mike laughed and put his hand on my back. You two will have time for that later. Now let's go inside and get Moon cleaned up first and get him fed. The house had three bedrooms. Uncle Mike and Aunt Sarah slept in one and Alice had another. I was to share the last room with David. My bed hadn't arrived yet, but Aunt Sarah assured me that it would look just like David's. She showed me the place where my bed would go and get in a closet where I could put my things. I don't have much, I told her. Just some old traps and some clothes I made. I made. I got Pap's personal box, too. We'll take care of that, she said. You'll have the same things as every other boy has. I looked at David, and he smiled and nodded like they had been talking about it. We seated ourselves around the dinner table, and Aunt Sarah served pork roast and creamed spinach and buttered sourdough bread. It was better than any food I'd ever had in Forrest or in Jail or in Pinson or even in Hal's. At first, nobody said much, but I could feel them watching me. I was uncomfortable at the table, and I did my best to hold my silverware the right way. Eventually, Uncle Mike reached over and took my bread and pinched my pork with it and held it out to me like a sandwich. I set my fork and knife down and I smiled and took it from him. Everyone began to laugh. And before long, we were all eating our pork in a sandwich. That's weird for lunch today. I have a pulled pork sandwich I'm about to make. <laughs> so show us something, Moon, Uncle Mike said. Like what? Make an animal sound. David said. Well, what do you want to hear? Your best one. Well, it's a loud one. Well, do it anyway. Aunt Sarah put her glass down. Well, I don't know if it's okay, Sarah, Uncle Mike said. I set my, my sandwich down and I got out of my chair. I bent over so my hands rested on my knees. I sucked in my breath and I twisted my face in the right way and I made the sound of a bobcat scream. <laughs> When I looked up, everybody was staring at me with my, with my wide eyes. After a second, Uncle Mike began to clap. Aunt Sarah scooted her chair back and wiped the corners of her mouth with her napkin. Mm. My Lord, she said. That's a bobcat. Supposed to sound like a screaming woman, I told her. How about a wolf? David yelled. Aunt Sarah shifted in her chair and straightened her back. Now, I don't know about a wolf. Me neither, I said. There's no wolves in Alabama. I know coyote, though. Coyote, then, said Alice. I looked, up, I looked up at the ceiling, I pursed my lips, and I began barking like a coyote. Yup, yup, yup. Yes, sir? Um, they, they are true about a, a bobcat making a noise, because one night we was coon hunting, and we was uh, down in Lawrenceburg coon hunting at my, my daddy's house, my granddaddy's house. Yeah. We was down there, we woke up on a bobcat, and it ran up a tree, and it seemed like it didn't cry for me. And we, I went down there to do my, uh, go to my, like a crying, screaming lady at night. <laughs> when I looked down, David was sitting on top of his chair back, leaning forward toward us. What else, he stammered. How about a deer? 
David and Alice nodded and I tossed my head from side to side and I snorted like a flag deer. Now that's enough for now, Aunt Sarah said. Moon, you are very talented. They're gonna love you at school, David said. I smiled and got back into my chair. You think so? Yeah, nobody can do all those sounds. After we finished our meal, I told them about living in the forest. I, I described how Pap and I had built the shelter and the types of books that we studied. They wanted to know about the strangest things that we had eaten, and I told them about armadillo stew and snake rolls. I told them about the time it rained real hard and a rattlesnake family tried to move into the shelter with us. Yikes. They listened to me late into the night until Alice fell asleep against Mr. Uncle Mike's shoulder. I think it's time for us all to go to bed now, he said. It's been a big day. After saying goodnight to David and Alice, Aunt Sarah got a blanket from the closet and spread it over the sofa for me. When she was done, she put her hand on my back and asked me if it was if I was okay sleeping in the living room for my first night with them. Well, it's better than pine straw and, and ticks, I said. I like it just fine. She smiled and yawned. I'm glad you're so easy to please, Moon. Good night, you two. Good night, I said. I lay on the sofa and I pulled the blanket up to my chin. Uncle Mike sat across from me in the chair. You still okay? He finally said. I nodded. I know you've been through some tough times. I don't expect you to just slide into things around here. It was a lot to get used to. I'm feeling better already. It takes time to start a new life, especially when you come from a background as different as yours. I felt the soft pillow under my head and I listened to the ticking of the mantle clock. I like everything about this place. Uncle Mike smiled. His eyes told me what I needed to know about the type of father he would be. They were Pap's own eyes, but there was something more gentle and calm about him. I could tell that he wanted to say something that would make me feel better about all I'd been through in the last few months, but he didn't need to say anything. I'm going to be fine, I told him. You don't need to worry about me. The end. Anybody? Nobody else? A couple of you? There you go. All right. All right.